Welcome, everyone, to this breakout session on linguistic hospitality. Um, thanks for coming. We're excited um, to, to get to know you all a little better in this context. Um, so actually, uh, Lucas and I wanted to start um, quickly by asking everyone to just very, very briefly introduce themselves, um, in case anyone hasn't met yet, um, to facilitate our discussion a bit. Um, and we also w wondered if you could, um, because this is, uh, we didn't advertise it as such, but in some sense this is a, a kind of theory uh, discussion, uh, thinking about how we use theory in our translation practice. Um, and so we, we were curious um, whether you'd you know, just introduce yourself, tell us um, a little bit about something you're translating right now, and then um, if you would, uh, comment very briefly on um, whether and how you consciously use theory in your translation practice. So uh, this is meant to be a, just to kind of open up our, th our thinking about how, we, how we're already doing these things. Um, so if you would, I, I suppose we should pass the mic around, is that right, for your purposes? Okay, great. Sure, let's go here with Jen. Hi, I'm, I'm Jan Ronis of uh, BDRC, and I, I'm in the, uh, the right group this morning because I consider myself much more of a consumer of literature than a producer of translations, so, and I'm very interested in, in theory, um, theory as it informs my reading and just makes uh, my reading experience of literature um, more challenging, more fulfilling, um, and, and more just... Uh, giving me more uh, intellectual tools for interpretation uh, more broadly than just while I'm sitting in my chair and, and reading books. Um, and so I apply theory to my uh, Tibetan reading at times, um, helping me understand form better, um, form, and what else do I like a lot? Um, well, and another interest of mine is uh, illusion and uh, references to other works within the same genre or within literature more broadly. I think that's something that we don't um, talk about enough when we talk about um, literature and form. There's always the uh, experience and the aesthetics of it, but then there's also the way in which works play, uh, are part of a co broader conversation. Um, and so that's something that I, I like to discuss. Maybe we can have time for that today, but that's me. Um, I'm Stephen Gethin of the uh, Padmakara uh, translation group in France. Um, I'm currently translating, or I've almost finished, uh, Shechen Gelseb's uh, Ngundra Trieg, uh, and uh, I'm working on um, one of the volumes of the uh Zhe, the Natsok Tree Miscellaneous Instructions. Um, and uh, I can't say that I apply translation theory uh, very consciously uh, in, uh, as I uh, translate. Um, my translation started off uh, when I was in retreat and uh, I translate very much from um, a practitioner's point of view but I do find it very helpful to have input uh, from these sort of meetings um, on translation theory and I think uh, subconsciously a lot of that sort of sinks in. Um, so that's about it. Uh, my name is Chris. What's that? I think it's just for the recording. Oh, it's. Oh, okay. There's no. Okay. Uh, so. No, there's a important thing for the recording. Okay. Um, my name is Christina Munson, and I um, am working currently on two volumes of Sarah Condro's writings. One is her biography of her spiritual partner, Drime Ozer, the fifth son of Dujum Lingpa. The other volume is her collected um, sheldam, or spiritual advice. So I'm here because I think I would benefit from a little bit of theory in the way I'm thinking about the work I'm doing. Um, and I have at times played with conceptual metaphor as a theoretical basis for thinking about um, kind of how emotions are embodied in the language of these texts. And I've left that behind now because it seemed too complicated. So um, yeah, I hope to learn something here. Um, 
So I'm Janet Gyatso, and I have done some translation. Well, I've done a lot of translation here and there. I did a book of translation quite a long time ago, The Life Story of Jigme Lingpa, according to his own account. Um, but I'm currently in the process of... I've moved into the area of looking at poetics, and uh, I mentioned this very productive uh, relationship that I have with Pema Bum, a Tibetan scholar, and I'm trying to encourage him to continue working with me to translate more stuff. So we're currently actually just starting to translate the autobiography of a contemporary um, uh, Tibetan aristocrat who, may, who was like one of the last living um, members of the Dalai Lama's government who made it out and who's living in the United States right now, but looking at the literary qualities of this particular text. And, and so this has just started. I'll say, you know, I've studied a lot of theory, and theory is really in interesting and important. I, I don't think of theory at all when I'm translating. For me, the most, I do it all in intuitively in terms of, it, it, the very important role of the person that I'm working with, in this case it's Pema Bum, and in the past it have been other people, and just trying to get the spirit of the text and then trying to morph it into something that's alive, and I, I really don't have any you know specific methods. I just try to do it, so that's not very good, but anyway, that, that's what I do. Hello, is this on? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I see. Okay, got it. Okay, I'll project my voice. So uh, I'm Nima Cape, also known as Pema Kondro. I had a long career teaching Buddhism before I came to the um, academic world. I'm also a fifth year PhD student in the University of Virginia. And um, with my translating, oh, and basically I work on two projects. I've been working on translating the Namtars of Nudin Dorje, who's most known as the treasure revealer of Yeshe Sogel's uh, full-length um, biography. And uh, for my dissertation, I'm doing a textual history of the Khandra Ningtig. So these are my projects. And um, I'm really interested in making my process of translation more conscious in terms of theory, because I noticed until we had the last Lotsawa conference, um, which was a year ago, I guess, I would translate my the materials I would do for Dharma communities as more of a poetic act, really paying attention to the meaning and then when I translate for my academic work, it's very literal. I don't want to miss anything. I'm um, The artistic part hasn't been there. And I remember at that conference, Janet had said, oh yeah, when I'm done translating, I show it to a poet. And this totally revolutionized my way of thinking of translation. And so I'm really trying to bring more of an aesthetic quality to the work that I do um, in the academic translation world. And so uh, I'm not totally conscious of the theory that I bring um, to that translation. I think it is intuitive, but I am trying to make it more conscious, and that's why I'm here. Yeah. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Dingell, a first-year PhD and student at Columbia. I, I haven't done any translation, although I have done some sort of... Uh, um, Freestyle, I uh, guess, uh, translation of contemporary Tibetan po um, poems. Uh, when I translate, I don't think I, uh, I don't really know much about translation theory in general, but I do think about sort of the intersubjective relation between my own feelings when I'm translating something and then the feelings that are being expressed in the text that I try to engage with. Uh, um, I realize that sometimes I translate something and I get something after, like translate that and then come back after some time or maybe even a few weeks and then I get a totally sort of different uh, reading of it. And then I was thinking, oh, wha why is that? Like, uh, is it my feelings that it's like affecting the work that I'm trying to translate? Or is, so that, that, that these are the questions that I had uh, in, in, in when I'm like engaging with the text. Uh, 
but not like, uh, I guess, so in some sense, I'm also trying to engage the theory uh, aspect of the translation when I do. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Lama Jab, and um, I am a research fellow and uh, language and uh, literature teacher at Oxford University. Um, I translate all sorts of texts, but at the moment I'm um, translating, I'm trying to get into translating quite a lot of kind of Tibetan traditional songs. Um, so to, I just want to convey the kind of poetic nature of that side and um, especially kind of traditional Tibetan songs are very prevalent and uh, quite influential in Tibetan culture. So I want to convey that across, that's one reason. And I look at, uh, I'm not, like Janet Janso said, I'm actually not, although sometimes <laughs> I sound theoretical, I'm not into theory that much. Um, I mean, I do read theoretical texts. Uh, I do find them helpful. I use them as kind of torchlights to shine on certain phrases and texts and things like that. Uh, but when I translate, uh, I, I try to translate. Usually I translate a text when, it, when I find them compelling. I, I usually only translate things that compels me. Um, so I, I don't let myself to be dictated by theory when I translate, but I do find theory useful. So I'm Lauren Hartley, and I work as a Tibetan studies librarian at Columbia. Um, I also teach literature uh, on occasion at Columbia um, from early to present. I think I'm best known for my modern literary work, and I used to do quite a bit of translation maybe even 20 years ago. Um, I, at Indiana, where I did my graduate work, I took, I had a comparative literature uh, minor and a certificate in translation. I think at this point it's sort of like all up here generally, and I think it informs my practice, but not so uh, deliberately. So I would like to actually, and I'm really inspired by the reading for today, um, I could imagine yeah, just sort of more, more consciously, I guess, bringing it in. That said, I do have a practice which I think borders on your deconstruction, reconstruction idea. I think that's how, I, I have a very deliberate way that I sort of approach translation. And would like to continue that. I've worked on Dokar Watsering Wangyal's Kalun Tokchur, um, various uh, contemporary or modern pieces. And I think going forward, I'm really interested in, um, I would like to work on a biography or autobiography from maybe 17th, 18th, or 19th century yet. And, hoping to get into something like that within a year, a project like that. So. Hi, I'm Julie Reagan. I teach Asian religions at LaSalle University in Philadelphia. And I came to the study of Buddhism as an academic through literature. My background is in literary studies um, and uh, my work as a literary writer, performance works, novel. Um, and I came to work with Janet Gyatso actually out of my um, own Buddhist practice and my interest in the way that um, that literary works that, in my experience, uh, take us beyond conceptuality in ways that pr through poetics. So my work is on Buddhist poetics, um, and uh, I ended up doing a PhD in religion, Buddhist studies, and a and a subfield in comparative literature to kind of extend my my literary studies. So one of my exams was on translation to, and looking at traditional Tibetan theories of translation along with um, contemporary stuff. So I am. Um, for my dissertation, I, I ended up, um, although I was mostly trained in Tibetan studies, uh, going more deeply into Sanskrit to work on Ashvagosha because I was so moved by uh, his works, uh, Buddha Charita and Sandra Nanda, and the ways in which he says he needs to tell truth in the form of poetry for an audience interested only in pleasure and not liberation. Um, and so I'm interested in the ways that, that, that the, the text creates a path for the reader of experiential understanding through the senses, um, through the rasas, um, and um, and ultimately, the focus of the of the dissertation and the book I'm working on now from that is um, the the Canto of the Enlightenment, which is only available in fragment form in Sanskrit. So I'm reading it with the Tibetan, um, and uh, and I decided to do a full translation of it finally, um, and of that Canto. And as I did, I really relied on translation theory to to guide me, 
and um, and particularly the work of Borges, I find very inspiring. The idea that the um, the translation can be better than the original. He actually takes perhaps the greatest Spanish poet, and he's a Spanish writer, um, San Juan de la Cruz. You know, and he says actually there's this Scottish translation that's so much better. <laughs> and he, you know, and so I I'm, and so from my own um, translation at the end of the in the appendix, I really felt like this needs to work as a literary text in English. This needs to have, um, and, and therefore it needs to depart from the Sanskrit Tibetan, you know, um, more, more than, we went, more, than we're comfortable doing in academic settings. Um, and so I used Borges to help support me in doing that and, and some, other, some other translation theorists. Um, and I'm excited to continue to think about this. I'm going to be on the panel at IATS on um, uh, translations of Tibetan Buddhism. So I hope to think more about it. Hi, my name is Nishita, and I'm a graduate student at uh, Northwestern University. Um, lately, I've been translating this text by Jamyang Kense Wangbo, which is a short biography of um, Chogyur Lingpa. And I have actually not received all that much theory um, as far as translation is concerned, so I look forward to learning about that here. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so I realized also we should introduce ourselves, right, uh, since we asked you all to do that. Uh, so I'm Dominique Townsend, and um, I teach at Bard College. I uh, teach Buddhist studies there. And um, in many ways, I would say like Jan, I'm much more of a consumer of translation. I mean, I use translation a lot in my work, but more and more I'm becoming fascinated with, uh, you know, tr translation as a practice and the ways that theory either supports or, or sort of torchlights that. Um, that sort of practice uh, of Tibetan li uh, literature in particular. Um, and so the one translation I am working on actively right now is of um, uh, a text composed by Lochan Dharmashri, uh, which he received from Tarek Lingpa on um, dream practices. Um, and so uh, that's something that I've been playing with a lot in terms of how to um, convey the sort of uh, literary aesthetic, uh, the very particular kind of aesthetic impact that I feel in the Tibetan into the English and experimenting with, um, with attempting to sort of use, uh, follow the form of the Tibetan in ways that disrupts and, and um, I think actually enlivens the English as far as I'm, at least I'm trying to do. So um, I, I, I love uh, thinking about theory and reading theory and I think also um, I'm interested, I kind of do a dance with it of, of thinking about how this can, th this way of seeing through certain kind of theories can affect the way I do things. Um, and, and certainly there are moments in which I'm really thinking about that actively, but um, I think more often than not, it becomes a part of our intuitive uh, sort of process um, as well. So I think it's interesting to hear people talk about the ways that we go in and out of really actively trying to apply something as maybe an experiment and then start to kind of embody it and and it becomes sort of more, it feels more natural to us. I'm, I'm interested in that process as well. Thanks. Hey, I'm Lucas Carmichael. I'm here at CU as a lecturer in the Religious Studies Department, and I actually do not work on Tibetan material. Um, I work on Chinese material, um, and I co-lead a um, seminar for AAR with Holly Gailey on the um, what do we call that? We call that the transnational religious circulation um, and the movement of uh, ideas, uh, peoples, and materials uh, related to religion between Asia and North America. Uh, and I, too, am more of a consumer, I think, of translation than producer, but I would call myself actually a historian of translation. Um, and I got interested in this whole circulation of information between Asia and North America through my own reading of the Tao Te Ching and um, did my uh, dissertation work on that. 380 English translations of the Tao Te Ching uh, that have been produced since 1868. Um, and I'm really in search of theory that helps me understand this like, diversity of translations, that helps me understand what individual authors were trying to do, and that seems adequate to this just uh, massive amount of difference uh, that we see when a translation actually occurs. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's enough on that. Um, it's already come up. There is a, a reading for today of sorts. And so I think you received an email from Dominique. Um, and it's encoded in the title of, of the talk, Linguistic Hospitality. Um, but if you weren't familiar with Recur's essay before, that would maybe not be as obvious. Um, Dominique and I selected some passages from the text. And we'd like to pass those around so we have 
paper to work off of. I think there should be enough here. And Dominique has the book. Yeah, you know, it's from uh, three short essays that Paul Ricoeur delivered on translation theory. Um, and from what everybody's been saying so far, Recur might come at this from a very different angle. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Recur is sick of theory when he writes this um, and very well versed in it. Um, and so he's an author who, who very much has done a deep dive into translation theory um, and in some ways finds theory to be inadequate um, to practice. Um, and so part of the thing that Dominique and I were going to say at the beginning was what attracted to this, to this essay. And maybe we'll just do maybe five or ten minutes each about that. Um, and then we have a set of focused questions that we'd like to break up into small groups and have each group um, take a different question. Um, and then we'll come back together and each group can sort of present on that question and start a conversation on that. And we can move into a large group discussion for the remainder of our time. So for me, and you feel free to read through the essay while I'm talking here, um, I wanted to direct attention to a couple sections um, that resonated strongly with me. Um, the first one is at the end of the front page, or the first side of the page, um, where it goes below uh, the translation as a challenge and source of happiness. Um, and here's where Recur takes aim at um, the theory that he sees operating um, in most uh, people's approach to translation. Um, and he sees that it comes to a sort of impasse where people are either obsessed with untranslatability, that the diversity of languages and the gaps between languages and cultures leave us in a position where translation seems theoretically impossible. Um, and maybe um, really all we can do is sort of manage, I don't know, the aftermath of it. So Lama Jab, you brought up uh, Lawrence Venuti um, on your talk um, yesterday. Um, and he's, I think, a theorist who really, at the end of the day, says translation cannot be accomplished, and all we can do is hope to minimize ethnocentric violence. And, and so that's one sort of position that oftentimes theory falls into, um, where it's just these gaps are impossible to cross, um, and that sort of leaves us at an impasse. Um, on the other side uh, are theorists who are looking to cross those gaps by constructing some sort of bridge across it. And uh, Recur focuses specifically on um, people who have tried to correct uh, the universal language type bridges. So Walter Benjamin also came up in your talk, uh, bringing a primary example of someone who thinks of uh, translation you know, he talks about the afterlife of a text and the movement of translation, but at the end of the day, that essay is really focused on uncovering the idea that translation can point us to a universal language and a divine language and point us to God, because in order to cross such impassable gaps, we must have some sort of transcendent idea or transcendental like, process, something, a universal guarantee of it. Um, so those people tend to focus on the bridge as much as anything else, um, but also um, don't necessarily focus on the practice. So it seems like Recur is unsatisfied with both of those options. And part of the point of his essays, um, and even the selections you see here, is to say maybe we should you know, return to the fact that translation occurs and has always occurred. You know, um, people speak different languages. Historically, we've always translated without any need for theory at all. Um, and maybe our theory should come more from the actual practices of the translation that we see than like, these um, discussions of this gap and the sort of uh, transcendental ways we might cross that. So I really like this idea. I think it's accurate to a lot of translation theory and model. Um, it sets up this gap between um, the languages. And, um, and what I like about what Recur does is he redirects us to a way that that gap is maintained, but also that the translator can dwell in it um, sort of comfortably. And so that's where the, his idea of linguistic hospitality comes in. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the session, about what he really means by that, um, and how Recur positions a translator in between this gap in a way that he's comfortable with. Um, yeah, uh, so that's one section I want to look at there. Um, I think that I'm, I'm unsatisfied with translation theories that leave the gap open and uncrossable. I'm also unsatisfied with uh, theories that cross it too easily. Um, and by translation, translators that cross it too easily, who don't really attend to the problems that could be in their practice. Um, and Recur uh, directs us to the ethics of translation also as something that we need to attend to. Um, particularly after Lama Job's talk um, yesterday, a uh, second thing really jumped out at me, which is in the middle of the back page there. Um, uh, Recur is talking about the drama of translation um, and the wager a translator makes to undertake such a drama. There's tensions in translation. Um, and he says at this stage of the dramatization, it happens that the work of mourning finds its equivalent in the translation studies and puts its harsh but invaluable corrective into it. Um, and I'll summarize this in one line. Give up the ideal of perfect translation. 
Um, so for some of you that were here to maybe learn more about theory, like in a lot of ways we're cursed and it's the other direction. Uh, but he gives a good window into like a lot of theory that's out there um, and that you could look at. Um, but you know, also encourage us to say don't get too wrapped up in the theory. Uh, but part of what theory teaches recur is that the ideal of perfect translation is standing in the way of actually some progress. Um, and so, Lama Job, when you were talking yesterday, I was recalling that, as far as I know, the first example of translation in English, um, and I think this is from in the OED, um, is actually used in a Christian context to refer to translating the body into heaven. You know, in the second coming, we will all be translated into heaven with our bodies and souls intact, just as Jesus was translated um, into heaven. And so it's a, it's idea of a perfect translation um, in a religious context um, that first is the, comes into English as translation and very quickly then is applied to ideas of translating literature and works. Um, and I feel like it's an idea that always has been premised on a perfect translation. And that helps me understand why the theorists tend to come to this impasse where perfect translation is impossible and we just have to give up on entirely or perfect translation has to have some sort of almost divine aspect of it to uh, ensure. Um, and I really appreciated thinking about um, the bardo as a, like a, a process of translation um, and reincarnation of text as something different than what the sort of Christian theological model would lead us to. Um, Although towards the end of the talk, you brought up the idea of like, there's eventually maybe we're all enlightened. There's total enlightenment. And eventually like just the robes are left behind. And even in like the Buddhist theory, maybe there's also an ideal of perfect translation. Um, but perfect translation, as Recur puts out here, tends to stand in the way. Um, and part of what we need to be comfortable with is sort of an imperfectness, but still trying to be ethical in that process. Uh, so those are the two points of this essay that really jumped out at me. Um, and then I'm going to hand this back to uh, Dominique, and she'll talk about it a little bit. And then when we divide up in our groups, we'll direct questions that will help you like, uh, reflect on certain aspects of this essay and we can talk about it together. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'll be brief because I want to um, move into the small group uh, section so we can sort of really get into the text. I also wanted to mention if anyone's having one of those kind of panicked dreams of remembering being an undergrad and not being prepared for seminar, um, we we tried to design this. We, we did send the essay out, but also tried to design the workshop so that assuming that you haven't read the essay. So if you have, wonderful. Um, if you haven't, we hope that we have enough here to at least whet your appetite, right, and to think about how we might use this for our focused discussion. So to put your mind at ease about that. Um, I actually came to the uh, to this book or this collection of um, essays which were orig originally delivered as lectures um, uh, out of a wish to help my undergrads actually, uh, you know, in uh, teaching at Bard, um, think about uh, what we're taking in when we read translations, because I primarily teach uh, translations of primary source Buddhist texts. And so oftentimes translation is sort of um, an un, um, identified or um, unspoken part of their process of learning how to read and uh, interpret and analyze texts. And so um, I, I turn to this, I, I, I only assign it to sort of upper level seminar students, but um, I have found it really useful, uh, particularly I think this ideal of um, linguistic hospitality <clears throat> that uh, Recur presents as a way of sort of, uh, in some sense, I find students often respond to translations like, this is much too clear and coherent and easy in the English. This can't be a good translation. You know, sort of like this is, it just can't be, you know, or that it's, it's sort of so distanced or so awkward that they're, you know, much more kind of critical. But I, in some sense, I was trying to kind of help them develop both an awareness of the translator's voice and hand in what we read, but also a kind of maybe in some sense a sort of sympathy for the work of translation. Um, as an ethical act and as a creative act. Uh, and so um, I have found these essays quite uh, sort of useful for opening up those kinds of conversations and in some sense for instilling in students an awareness of the, all these questions that we've been talking about um, uh, this weekend so far. Um, and so maybe I'll just read one passage um, which Lucas alluded to, but on the, again on that first page um, when Ricoeur writes, indeed, it seems to me that translation sets us not only intellectual work, theoretical or practical, but also an ethical problem. Bringing the reader to the author, bringing the author to the reader, at the risk of serving and of betraying two masters. 
This is to practice what I like to call linguistic hospitality. So for me, in some sense, this condenses so many of the kinds of questions and problems of, of both how uh, we in this room engage in translation, but also how um, other people uh, read and process, interpret translations that they're um, you know, whether it's assigned in class or as a practitioner or as a scholar. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at that. Um, and certainly, uh, so our next uh, phase in terms of our, our timeline for our group, to our time together is to break into small groups. Um, and so I think it'll be perfect that we'll uh, be in groups of four. Um, I would like to say too, though, if anyone has any comments or questions uh, as we're beginning, certainly you should feel free to, to um, speak out as well. Um, any questions so far about what we've, what we've mentioned? Observations? No, okay, so let's get into small groups so we can really um, kind of delve in a little bit more and have a chance to, um, to discuss these questions a bit. Um, so I think for ease, let's just, uh, well, we can just make groups that are sort of uh, closest to us. Um, so maybe Lucas, would you like to go there? Yeah, and I'll come here, and then maybe that group in the back could be a group of four. Um, and so the questions, uh, or rather, in some sense, we've decided to pose these more as topics for each of the groups uh, to engage in. Um, the first is on the ethics of translation, how we understand that, um, and particularly how, uh, how we might sort of be guided in our thinking about that through um, the sections we've, we've given you here of Ricardo's work. Um, the other is on, uh, he talks about the resistance to the foreign. Um, and I think in some sense, in thinking about the ethics of translation, there's a certain way in which this is also so sort of topical, um, geopolitically, right, thinking about uh, the crises, that, the uh, migration right now, and the sort of the, the struggle, um, both uh, these questions about hospitality and welcoming um, people who are, who are um, in, in the status of refugees, I think is also kind of laden or, or um, inherent here. Um, so this idea that he talks about of the resistance to the foreign, and he turns in some sense to psychoanalytic um, writing about that. Uh, the other is, um, and this uh, is a question on retranslation, and uh, for that group, so Lucas's group, you're gonna be looking at some um, translations of the Tao Te Ching and thinking about this as a kind of process of retranslation. Um, and then, so are we four groups? I think we should do the three. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah that's great. And then also just to keep in mind for all the groups, like what is linguistic hospitality actually consist of and how useful is this? How useful is it really? I mean, that's in some sense what we hope to get out of this is, is this a way of kind of thinking about or looking at translation that we could um, use in our own practices? Okay. Any questions, Janet? Okay, right. So, so I, we didn't. I know we're not going to look at all those. So, I think let's do this. Let's do uh, this group. will work on um, the uh, the question of retranslation and the handout on the Dao Te Ching, and then um, maybe in the back that that group, if you'd work on the question of the ethics of translation. Do we have something more specific looking at? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this. this. This handout. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just just this, right. yeah. So these are excerpts from the longer essays that we shared on Google, but we thought that we could make better use of our time if we have some kind of highlighted areas. Okay, so, so what is that question again? Um, okay. The ethics of translation, yeah. So I think the first step is to sort of locate that in the essay. Locate like, in the lo essay. Locate in the essay in terms of recurs thought, but then also we definitely want you to be reflecting on how does this line up with questions you've asked uh, or questions that you think should be asked. Um, experiences you've had in your own translation practice, experiences you've had thinking about theory. Uh, you, you want us to locate this in recurrence thought? Mm -hmm. or, or we, 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 we don't know if recurrence thought. No, just, 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 just out of here. Just yeah, to just find where he discusses he, it and why, he, and why he brings that up. Even the, the section I read is talking really, sp you could just go to there, right, to think about what does he mean by the what, ethics. What is he saying? Yeah, what is he saying about the ethics of translation? And our ultimate question when we come back is going to be about whether we can use this thinking. You know, whether there are ways that we can be guided by his thinking or not, right? Yeah, and what we'd like to do is after a little bit of time for group discussion, for your group to sort of come back and say, this is, you know, what you were initially thinking. Um, but then that to be other groups can then engage that idea also through sort of your group's work. Uh, and then we'll go through every group, I think, uh, together. Okay, so and we're going to work on this question of the resistance to the foreign. Okay. okay.
you don't even you're not even a master of your own language, right? Right. And so there's this great article, um, uh, monolingualism of the other, and he says the, the guy says I have only one language and it's not mine, and it's all about how actually you know you you're not a master of your own language. The, the language that you were raised in um, determines so much of, of what you think, and mm -hmm. that it you know essentially um, takes away you know your supposed autonomy. Right. And so. Uh, no one is truly monolingual, um, and that you're already in a precarious relationship to your own language. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's actually mm -hmm. a benefit for translation because it shows that there's not an unbridgeable gulf. Mm -hmm. It's coming at it from a different point of view. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, this thing. Oh, mm -hmm. Do you know this one? Da it's by Derrida. Yeah, the monolingualism. I don't. Monolingualism of the other. And I, it's mm -hmm. not worth the hundred pages of reading because it's, um, mm -hmm. you know the point could be stated. In Paragraph. Have you shaped Yes. <laughs> um, he goes off on all these mm -hmm. tangents and it's really terse. But um, uh, but I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, so there's this refrain. It's very literary. Over and over again. I have only one language and it's not mine. Mm -hmm. um, and he's speaking as a, um, uh, uh, a Jewish man born in Algeria who was raised in a staunchly French speaking mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. So he has a lot of um, complications with his mm -hmm. French language. Still, he means it more universally. Anyway, so I thought I would bring that up. Because it would seem then that kind of this idea of betrayal then is less relevant. So, oh, betrayal is less relevant. Yeah. And right. Then, if mm -hmm. there's already kind of a tenuous relationship. Tenuous relationship to your own language. Yeah. And you really think about how much we're already conditioned. Well, in a way that's out of our control. The question that constantly occurs to me mm -hmm. when I'm translating yeah. is that my readers, mm -hmm. almost every word, within languages, mm -hmm. but also this idea that if uh, you know, you're not the master of your language, it's not your own. I mean, yes. Like part of it seems to be that the language might be the master of you, yes. right? Kind of like that, mm -hmm. that, that idea is that what's going on also in the essay. Yeah. That that some of the ways we are like already approaching this and thinking, and like mm -hmm. we have no control over. Like sure. by virtue of the fact that the languages in which we operate, mm -hmm. is that is that part of what's happening? Yes. yes. Yeah. That there's an indeterminacy to the language, um, and that you can't ever fully master. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Constantly changing yeah, as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And which means that our translations mm -hmm. now, in 10 years' time, could be, yes. particularly at the speed things are moving, <laughs> right, right. could be totally out of date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. this gives us a retranslatability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, right. yeah. <laughs> it's perfectly needed. Uh, but yeah, so my experience with looking at the historical translations is they're, they're so obviously dated, mm -hmm. right? Like every time you see that, it's like, oh, this is a Victorian translation, mm -hmm. and this is a Colonial. Um, and yeah, they can still be beautiful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, which was so interesting. Very beautiful and also times very genuine, you know, attempts to actually see the person, but like they can't escape their context in some ways. So, like, inevitably, our translations in, you know, 10, 20, 50 years, like, people will look dated to whatever comes along afterwards because of those ways that languages change and culture changes. And, you know, we, we, aren't, we aren't entirely in control of, yeah. of this process. Sure. Like, and now I think, yeah, for, and so the, the broader point is, you know, it's hard to have knowledge of yourself if it's linguistically mediated and that language is not completely within your grasp. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Let alone knowledge of the other. Let alone knowledge of mm -hmm. the other, yes. So in the essay, uh, it's on the, uh, the back of the yeah. page where, <coughs> where he brings up retranslation. Um, and so more or less, like what I think what I was which, sketching, which is right, right. this is in the final paragraph mm -hmm. actually. Um, so he's talking about giving up on perfect translation mm -hmm. um, and sort of being okay with um, correspondence. In a new environment, like I was recently in, in uh, Buenos Aires, and the, the culture was a lot of hospitality. And you come in and you speak a little Spanish, they really appreciate it. You try, they speak a little English, you know, um, and you try and you pick up cultural rituals, like certain ways of drinking coffee. You know, or tea, or, um, and in the Tibetan context too, and in the Buddhist context, I think about the offerings one makes, like you know, to a guest, you know, offerings of water and of food, and, and the ways in which um, translation can work with both languages to do that. A little bit like what Yasuo yeah. Majab says, but I think we see it often in literary form, like in Latin American literature in English. Um, you see the use of the Spanish terms that are then kind of explained in the context, like you know, mi hija, you know, and then it's like. And then it's like, you know, 
multiple witness or something, and, and retaining the, the term shunyata, mm -hmm. which then teaches the audience gradually the meaning of that Sanskrit term, so they begin to understand how you can use emptiness with it, you can use multiple terms. Or there was a Padmakara translation of um, Chandukirti, which I just looked at because the person whose translation I was helping, you know, was, was from Chandukirti, so I was like immediately like, I need other people's translations, not mine. And, uh, and they translated this homage to Manjushri, which was from Manjushri Kumara, you know, this kind of Shonu Manjushri. Um, and they broke it down, they translated the whole name, so they said, you know, they translated like Jam and Paul as the, you know, the glorious, um, and the, um, uh, you know, and the Shonu, the youthful, um, and the um, tender for Jam, you know, Jambo. And, um, and the ways in which we can both like include a foreign word and explain it, you know, and somehow um, both sort of be good guests in the language, you know, like taking on a little of the language or a little of the rituals of the culture and the way that they can be you know, faithful to our responsibility as translators to not lose the complete context. I don't know that we always, I mean, I as a translator, I don't always do that. Like for Ashwagosha's work, I really went with Borges, who was like, you know, it wasn't even, he wasn't saying this Spanish translator was better than St. John of the Cross, but he was saying like, this particular verse, the Scottish translator gets this like hushed sound of the house thing, mm -hmm. that, that the suspira and you know, John is, you know, the one is getting at even better, you know? And so there are ways we can, And so, how, do you see that, like, where do, where does resistance figure in there? Well, I see that it depends so much on the text. Like for me, with Ashwagosha, I feel like it's really sort of timeless text. Like it has this cultural context, which is the like first or second century BC, and so he's drawing on a kind of courtly culture, and you want to be faithful to that. But I'm against like Mukherjee all about to using sort of old-fashioned courtly language in English because I feel like. Ashwagosha is speaking to his time and to his people in his way, and therefore I need to speak to my time and my people in this way because it is a kind of um, story that transcends culture, stories that we live in. So he's making it live for that audience, and I'm making it live for this audience. It's not like I'm bringing in rap music, you know, I don't that, but I just feel like the, I don't need to preserve that cultural context so much, you know, and, and there's nothing to lose. I'm not like, um, that culture doesn't need to be preserved. We're, 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 we're dealing with a Tibetan term. I'd be much more likely to be sympathetic to what Lama Chad is suggesting that we want. You know, there's a way in which the Tibetan language itself and the Tibetan language itself might be lost mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, like when I'm doing a translation for my, for my book project now, I'll footnote more literal passages to give the literal, if it's the Sanskrit or the Tibetan, to be faithful to the text while going, if I'm going too far, if I'm going out, which I'm which I won't say it's too far, but if I'm going out there, I'll, I'll footnote it. And you can do that in an academic context, but in other contexts, like if it were contemporary poetry or something, I might want to be doing the Tibetan more. Hmm. Um, and, and then and help the audience understand that this, what those terms might be. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, um, as I read this, um, I was thinking actually, so very recently, I've just started to prepare for my um, theories and methods exam in religious studies. And I've been reading, just started reading the works of Talal Asad actually, and what he has to say about translation in particular. <laughs> Talal Asad. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong um, on, on what I've read of his work because I've pretty much just started. Um, what are you reading? Uh, uh, he, he's written the, like few books, but the one that I'm reading at the moment is Genealogies of Religion. Uh -huh. okay. um, and so I, I was wondering if anyone's familiar with this work, if we could kind of like bring Rigor and, and Asad into conversation because from whatever I've, I've understood here so far, like Rigor's like slightly more takes a little more optimistic view of translation than Assad does because Assad basically is highlighting this issue of translation of 
more of the what we get lost, what is lost yeah. and what is gained. Yeah. Because just because of like the issues, because he's looking particularly at like the Sharia and Islamic mm-hmm. issues, right? Yeah. Literature and in contemporary times, and and sometimes I f- I face that like. So I, I FTA'd like last um, year in Jodhpur Buddhism and just, you know, talking to my students about like suffering, you know, that word suffering. And I'm just like, I, I, and I'm, I'm trying to tell them that it's it's not quite suffering, you know, dukkha, mm-hmm. like, you know, it's it's more, or dukhnya for that matter, it's, it's more like this underlying anxiety that we have with us at all times. So the suffering, I mean, conveys this like, you're sick or like this physical suffering or something. So I kind of like have this bias towards like Talal Asato because he's he brings that up. That like because we're not in that social cultural dynamic like maybe we have to just accept that we're not gonna get certain things. And um, I guess like that the question that like that leaves us with now is like what where do we go from there? Like what what do we do? That, right, and I think he's saying that a little bit, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, I was wondering whether like we can bring those to the conversation, or like then is that like something that like every translator just like accepts that like okay, you know, there's gonna be stuff lost, and then like I can't remember like who maybe Jan Kiatsu like said something about like well we gain stuff. Mm-hmm. As well, right? So this is something I guess which is my takeaway because like I was leaning more on like the lost side. Yes. Um, so yeah, I guess like so I, I so the word resistance exactly like made me think of of a sad. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think you're saying something similar to what I'm saying, and uh, and I think that that teaching the students dukkha, which I also do, I always teach that because suffering is a problem with word in English, and um, it does extend then even like the English concept. I agree with you completely, and I love um, the possibility of sort of expanding what the, the English means, right, by meeting, by the ways that it meets Buddhist literature, for instance, right? I mean, if we start to understand, it, I agree with you, it's not uh, appropriate to just use suffering, but if we start to extend what we mean by suffering to be this anxiety, what if we really identify that as not just something that we take for granted, right, but that that's, that, uh, you know, that's more in the context of Dugna, the thing that's always there, that maybe doesn't have to be there, right? Um, but um, but I think in terms of the resistance that um, that uh, Ricoeur is talking about is I think uh, more to do with um, something that's comparable in our in our social and political life, right? Which is a, a fear of the foreign and an ethnocentrism, a sense that the, that ours is better actually, and that the English you know is going to be somehow. Um, muddled or corrupted by the presence of the foreign when we bring it into English. And so I think that's partly what he's, when, you know, he talks about betrayal and faithfulness, right? We are, we're kind of constantly, perhaps, if, if, if seeking a perfect translation, then we end up in a fight between the, the reader and the, um, and the author, right? That we have to be either, we have to be faithful to one and, be, and betray the other. And I think Rupert is interested in first identifying that resistance. Do we have that resistance? And in English, and, and um, or or do we do we fear that resistance in the reader when we bring this into English? You know, are we are we fearful that the reader is going to reject it or judge it or you know, and and how does that impact our practice? I think is part of what I'm interested in what he's getting at here. Um, and also, I think by in linguistic hospitality, what he's suggesting is yes, we are going to betray and be faithful. Uh, to both, to both, in some sense, right? That's what hospitality is. You have to kind of make everybody a little bit uncomfortable um, while trying to serve everybody's needs at the same time, right? When we bring people into our home, for instance, there's a way in which we're disrupting the home, but we're also the other. The, the visitor is not really fully at home there either, right? And that kind of both an acceptance of the faithfulness and betrayal. Is, 
cohabitating kind of within our process um, is, is what I'm, I'm interested in. But I'm, I guess I'm curious about this idea of the resistance of the reader, right? He said resistance on the side of the reader must not be underestimated. The pretensions to self-sufficiency, the refusal to allow the foreign to mediate, have secretly nourished numerous um, linguistic ethnocentrisms and more seriously, numerous pretensions to the same cultural hegemony. Yeah. So, yeah. so he's, you know, I think he's actually interested in the same things that Talal Asad is interested in, but it's true in some sense he's kind of falling more on the side of a kind of a optimism based in a, a refusal to kind of participate in this idea of a perfect, of an ideal on, on either side. Where is that passage? The, the one I just read is up the page, oh, the top. Yeah. Talal, did you want to well, I think, oh, sorry, sorry just one follow-up question yeah. to what you were saying with the languages that's happening uh, almost spontaneously that these translations are having to happen. And this really comes out of a whole um, kind of nexus of meaning that one has, even when we're doing oral interpreting or written interpretation, that we're not just interpreting that text, but we bring with it the context of all of our other knowledge and how we make these translation choices. And so I think that's in a place where the person is present. And, and that's really clear in oral interpreting when terms are rendered. Um, in one way, they could be rendered a totally, you know, to speak in Nyingmapa um, worldview. It could be uh, the same term could be rendered in a Sutriana way even though it's actually in a Dzogchen context, or it could be rendered in a Dzogchen way, even though it's in Sutra. And that the interpreter is really performing that sometimes unconsciously based on the context that they bring. And so I think that this, um, maybe that's the second point, but there's this, for, back to the first point, I think this suspension, for it to take place, there has to be this sense of the equal capacity of these languages to convey the meaning, and that they're both a kind of window into a meaning. Um, yeah, I, I, know. Know what I would say about this. Uh, I'm, I'm oh, I, I certainly agree with you that there's something to be gained, and he's yeah. definitely yeah. saying that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I find myself like every time we, our conversation so far, it goes one way, and I want to push the other way, and then they go another way, and I say, no, 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 you've got to go back that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I, I very much like the idea that we, we shouldn't think of English as a kind of poor language that's not capable of yeah. translating. Very good language. <laughs> to that. On the other hand, it, it certainly is the case that you can't translate exactly. No one can yeah. deny that because any given word in, in any given word in a language has a position with respect to all the other words yeah. in the language, and it overlaps. It suggests no. It, it's very rare to find an, an English word that is embedded in its own context. It's yeah. going to have the same implication in innuendos and semantic range. Yeah. So there's n there's no question that things are lost, yeah. and and so. Um, what he is talking about, I think, in hospitality, when you look at what he's writing about the pretend that the very top of the page on the second page, yeah, yeah. the pretension to self-sufficiency. So I think the, the, the refusal to allow the foreign media, um, linguistic and ethnocentrism, yeah. pretensions to cultural hegemony, yeah, yeah, yeah. namely that. You know, I'm sitting here and I want you to make a translation that is going to make perfect sense to me and I don't want to be challenged and I know everything that there is to me. No. And so, you know, the linguistic hospitality has to be participated in by, certainly by the readers or the audience. They have to be willing to have something said that's not exactly familiar. You know, and but I think more than anybody, the translator really does have to be very open to you know going in both directions kind of at the same time. And yeah, I, I wonder about the choices. You know, so what kind of agency does the translator have? For, for me, it, it's not really like making choices, it's about listening and, and hearing, the, first of all, trying to hear the Tibetan and then trying to hear what it sounds like in English. It's like an aesthetic thing. 
almost vegetative. Yeah. I think that is, I think that, I mean, this, I think where, like what I said about the T.S. Eliot and everything, where individual talent actually lies in depersonalization, meaning of the being, immersing yourself in tradition and in all the other people's works. Likewise, I think that the agency of the translator lies in the ability to be compassionate to all the all the views and all the different two languages and to, to actually disappear, to, 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 to make yourself disappear. Although that seems contradictory, that's, that's where the agency lies, I think. Yeah. You know I mean? so, so one question would be, do we disappear or do we mostly disappear? So obviously we're always there because otherwise, <laughs> yeah. otherwise uh, like we'll be there. <laughs> yeah. And then also, what do we mean by agency? Because people use the term agency a lot, and normally we think of agency as something that's very willful, <coughs> like I am making yeah. this choice. But there's other kinds of moves and, and creative kind of yeah. ways that you get things to happen in yeah, various yeah. kinds of ways. I think that's what you're talking about, agency in a much broader yeah, yeah. Exactly. sense, which yeah. is very creative, it's very um, yeah. empathetic, yeah. compassionate, yeah. allows others to talk. Exactly. Yeah, and agency also is the negotiation of worldviews. It's the negotiation of ethical choices. But that's one place that defines agency is when we are making these choices as a, as a translator. I think one thing that you said here um, about the context that I want to highlight and just bring it out because with this translation we saw this morning where it was translated into the strength of masculinity and I felt that wasn't true to the context. As we all know, this is a very familiar trope and had, had, this, had that translator at that time been thinking of that trope and how it appears all over Buddhist literature and then translating it in a way that's sort of congruent with that, even though it comes to us as the foreign, then to me that's a, a better translation. And I, I like what you say that, that the reader has to be willing to experience something that's challenging or foreign or um, it's in a different paradigm and there's there may be that dissonance and I think as translators, it's not our job to erase it. I guess I'm deviating a bit, but I just wonder how old the term masculinity is. It's what? How old the term masculinity is. Yeah. Masculine, yeah. we know it's old, yeah. but masculinity, you know, mas yeah. femininity, yeah. masculine, how old are these terms? I don't know. Well, in, in especially in regard with the text, yeah. you know, when you translate such he's an old text. He's not talking about masculinity, he's talking about male. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly, but I'm just saying, yeah. Ma a male person, yeah. Geba, yeah, yeah. Is, is a man. Yeah, yeah. Geba means a man. Yeah. It's not masculinity. Exactly, so I'm saying when you translate such a yeah. text, which is, this is, a, I think it's a, Chanchup Chanchup Chopa, which is Budi what? I think Sanskrit, so I'm really yeah. bad at Sanskrit. Yeah. But from that text, so that text is quite an old text in yes. terms of time. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just wondering, like say 900 years ago, if the word masculinity existed in English. Oh, do you know what I mean? So like, yeah. do sometimes... In you, English? Yeah. At the time of Shanti Deva? Yeah, exactly. English wasn't even a language at the time of Shanti Deva. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there is a notion of masculinity in Buddhism. So there, or... or so the, so, the so that word is okay to, turn, to, to have that. But that's not what I think Shanti Deva is talking about. So poi, poi, Po, po Wang Wangbo and Mo Wangbo are in the Abhidharma as like this notion of Wangbo, which yeah, doesn't yeah. mean sexual organs, it means like your your faculties. Your faculties and your tendencies and so on. And then you get in like um, medicine. Really, that's one of the things I found this wonderful place where he talked about you can be a female, you can, you can be a woman anatomically, but you can have male characteristics. You can have a male personality style. So they're kind of aware of this notion of gender. You know, masculinity is gender, being a man is, is sex. Right? But it, it's, a, it's a wide 
widespread, as you say, in Buddhism at that time, there's a widespread idea that being born as a man is a better birth than being born as, as a woman. So if you're being compassionate, you would hope that you should be so lucky in your next life that you'll be a man. Yeah. You know, and that's, that would be yeah. good for you. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I like this question of mostly, should we be mostly invisible or mostly I'm not sure what the word you used what is this mostly? well he said totally I was the one who said yeah, mostly. mostly I said wait a minute not totally but yes <laughs> like you mostly one? invisible oh yeah yeah. 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 yeah yeah and also the idea of really listening I think that this is a, an important issue um, I think this is in terms of the linguistic ethnocentrism what's the path out of that and it is this really deep listening and looking to the culture at the time, and these questions of, oh, okay, 900 years ago, what is that paradigm there? And it's that deep listening that needs to happen. Yeah, yeah exactly. So different than like a dictionary yeah. definition. So I think when you, I mean, oral translation, simultaneous translation is a different question. Yeah. But when you're writing, I think if you're, you know, kind of translating a text that is 900 years old or something, into English, but you're using contemporary, modern, pro post-2000 yeah. English. So what is going on? I think that's a, that's a question you need to ask. Why you, that's why I'm talking about masculinity yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you translate an old text, yeah. we try to also use slightly classical, traditional English, or that's right. yeah, yeah, literary English, or we don't bother with it. You know, yeah. I, I think this. Uh, that's really, that's an important question. I'm not sure he's re raising that question, but it's no. definitely, <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, like, yeah. for example, like the life story of Milarepa, yeah. um, forget about Andy Quinnan, but, yeah. but even before he came on the scene, yeah. there was the older translation of Lama Kazigawa yeah, yeah. Sandra, yeah. and then there was, La Lomba had done a translation, yeah. and Lama Kazigawa Sandra used thee and thou, yeah, yeah. In that, in that, trans in that, you know, and I yeah. like that because yeah, yeah. that it made it feel like an old-fashioned, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it takes yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. you know, and I liked it better than the yeah, yeah. Lama text. I think Andy yeah. Quinn did a really good job yeah. now, and that that text yeah. really works well. Yeah. But, you know, many people don't like those using that old-fashioned yeah. English, but I agree, it makes it sound old, and it is exactly, old, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 And we can still, I mean, if if you use. English that is 400 years old, we can still make it really understandable to the yes, modern readership. Right. Yeah. You, know, yeah. 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 you wouldn't want to use, what is it, um, Canterbury? And yeah, yeah, I know. That's, like <laughs> that's impossible right. to yeah, understand. Yeah. Maybe when you translate Dongfang documents. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Old English. Yeah. 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 Well, it also depends on who you're translating for and what you're trying to do. Are you trying to appeal? Are you trying to represent it exactly? You know, like, um, and, and you know, in the thing about the Bodhicharya Vitara and this, this decision to make it the strength of masculinity was not to antagonize the audience. They, they didn't want all the women in the audience to get angry and say, I'm leaving Buddhism because it's a misogynist religion. So he's trying to keep people there by slightly shifting it to making it more acceptable. Whether that's a, I don't think that's a good that's thing. Not, uh, that's yeah. not a good thing. I mean, I, I, I regard myself as a Buddhist, but when I come across texts like that, I find when I'm actually like praying, yeah? like for instance, recently I recited yeah. that when Ghana passed away. Right. And, uh, we recited that kind of similar text, and it has got that thing in it. So I felt really uncomfortable, you know, you're really saying prayer in front of the altar. Yeah. So in my kind of mind's eye, I yeah. imagine that all the women being, being suppressed and repressed will get the yeah. rights of men that they have now. <laughs> so I can't visualize, my imagination yeah. is that. Oh, so you make it yeah, so I interpreted the line yes. as saying that the, yeah. the women will get the same yeah. rights, same yeah. power, and same you know, privileges of men that yeah. we have. So that's how I kind of visualize yeah. my, my own kind of uh, imagination, yeah. spiritual imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. But so I would still translate it as as it says, it's yeah. ugly, it's a ugly thing. You know, you have yeah. to be exposed to that. So yeah. see, like when you practice, let's see what you do. Yeah. Yeah. In Christianity, you know, the newer translations of the Bible, 
all the pronouns they make into he and she, yeah. you know, oh, wow. and, and really try, and there's, you know, translations of the Bible where they try to use the feminine pronoun where it totally was not in the original. Yeah. So there's reasons to do that, to, yeah. you know, yeah. but so it really depends on who you're translating for. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> We're not ethical. What's the ethics of the I'm just going to run to the restroom. Yeah. My ethics is lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> provocative statement which you could make about you know 20th century late 20th century Tao Te Ching's as well the, Dao, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a work of 19th century American spirituality mm -hmm. there's yeah. there's no Tibetan no. there's no Tibetan Book of the Dead no. it's not Tibetan it's not a book and it's not about the dead um, and Ursula Le Guin's you know Tao Te Ching you know you could in a way you could say it's not about the Tao uh -huh. um, and it's you know a work of uh, late 20th century American, you know, philosophy, which is, you know, very multicultural um, and open to outside influences and so forth, but mm -hmm. not really a translation. So, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it. Maybe, it, you know, we can say that at a certain point it becomes an interpretation, an interpretive rendition. Is that, that's, and I don't mean that in a pejorative. Is there something well, right, wrong with that? Right. No, a constant there was a translation and interpretation. Yes. And something very strange has happened every once or twice, and one or two other people have translated this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, one or two readers afterwards have said, mm -hmm. this is particularly translating uh, material by uh, contemporary masters. They've said, I can really hear uh, that particular rendition or whatever in the translation. Okay. And um, I don't take that as a, a particular conference, but I find it absolutely extraordinary mm. that they can, because I can't at all. I see it as very much, you know, my overlay on all those kinds of things. But somehow they see that. Sure. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. When a text doesn't have commentaries on it, you yes. know, so, I mean, that, that's great if there is, if there is a sure. plus one. But, um, yeah, some necessarily come just right. single. Single, yes. <laughs> Definitely, Which yeah. makes another. Um, I find just the kind of the relaxing out of the idea mm -hmm. of a perfect translation just immensely free. Yes. And, in fact, I mean, <laughs> you know, here also you can see that, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it goes from you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my sure. judgmental mind, and and for sure, I think uh, we do have some ability to discriminate what we think is accuracy, what is not. If we really see there are things that are mistaken, and so on, and so that's just helpful then in locating kind of at least an aspiration where one self would like to, to land yeah. in the process. But Stephen, I mean, if the Wami you're translating for has a particular type of sense of humor, well, this or is, this, something, this I mean, isn't interpretation, this is uh, translating mm. a, uh, let's say, a, a transcription. A transcription, a transcription. Yeah. sure. Yeah. But if some jokes or some kind of personal flavor was communicated during the oral teachings and then were included in the transcription. Yeah. Would, wouldn't your translation kind of convey that in a way that goes right back to the source? Yeah, they certainly try to. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. but okay. Quite often you see that the Lama 
will have been interpreted by another person mm -hmm. and then uh, transcribed by somebody yeah. who uh, could have introduced some. Oh, sure. And then I will take it mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. translate it. Because yeah, I will know the Lama. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's still it's my language, you know, my whole culture. Mm -hmm. edu Mm -hmm. Which comes out of it, yes. because I'm trying to express in my way mm -hmm. what I think the Lama has said. Yes. Um, uh, what's very interesting is that people hear different things from what Indian people have said. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. I find it remarkable that I get through it. Mm -hmm. it does it create an anxiety? That's how, like, Rick would talk about it, like, you know, for the translator. Like the, you know, is this? Am I getting it right? You know, the aspect of it that could be paralyzing and like that. And like that again, like giving up the idea of perfect translation, which I like the idea of the retranslation is sort of always an option. Like somebody else, like particularly when we have texts that like we have a record of, they they, yeah. they continue to circulate, mm -hmm. and like we may have had one conversation or facilitated one conversation, but like it's not going to be the last conversation. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that seems very liberating also. Like, mm -hmm. Somebody else will come along and maybe say something different. And we might think it's better or worse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, but either way, like it's, it's ongoing. Yeah. Um, and so part of what we do is just by, by continuing to bring, invite these texts to dinner. Right? Yeah. And so that way like I excuse some of these like, you know, mistakes or like, you know, questions is like, you know, Ursula Le Guin invited the text to, you know, over to her house. Right. And there was one conversation there, yes. um, and it provided like you know some people access to it. We might not have encountered the text another way, and I would hope they would continue to like, you know engage the text possibly yes. in other translations or just in the first <laughs> Ten years ago, when I was translating the Nippon uh, uh, commentary on the Sutra Lama book. Okay, so we agreed that I would sort of start off and then others will join in as well. Um, this actually was a, so we weren't agreeing on everything and we, so we had a very good conversation. Um, so the, the first thing I'll start with was sort of like my idea because we were trying to talk about ethics. First of all, and I suggested right away that we shouldn't think of ethics just in terms of what Ricoeur is talking about as ethics as good and bad, like, or right and wrong, or moral right and wrong, but ethics in the more general, deeper sense of mode of being in the world, like a way of acting, quite apart from a moral judgment. And I think it's, if, he doesn't use the word ethics in this um, passage, does he, or does he? Yes. So he's, he's framing right. the concept of linguistic practicality as a, a sort of answer to that ethical problem, okay. mode of, of engaging with that ethical problem. Right. Okay. So that's, that's right. Even there, I would see, you know, so the issue of betraying, serving and betraying, it's not necessarily good or bad because you could be serving a really bad guy. You, you could be, mm -hmm. be betraying a really bad guy, which would be a good thing to do. So it's, I think what he, when he talks about hospitality, He's talking about how the translator, what is the mode of being, a, how does a translator occupy that intermediate space? And, we, and what, is, what does it mean to be there? And we did start to take recourse to Buddhist ideas of no self and then also compassion, yeah. Uh, that, uh, that, that part of what was really necessary was to give up uh, your own uh, kind of um, 
when we talked about personhood, we didn't really pin this down, but to give up your own way of being per se and be, you need to listen very carefully or, he, or read very carefully to what the original is saying and then to somehow transmute that in a form that also can be you know, legible to people that you're translating for and that in order to do that, you needed to shut down a lot of your own ag agency per se. But then we actually started to talk about the nature of agency and what we meant by agency and and that there could be other, w normally when we use the term agency, it seems to imply a kind of uh, deliberate, uh, intentional sort of action where I say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to do this, or I'm, even the language of choice, we were actually sort of talking about, is the translator t making choices per se? I actually wonder if it's actually a choice but, or more a kind of talent. So the term talent came up from T.S. Eliot? T.S. Eliot talks about um, something called like depersonalization. So depersonalization being the ability to, to forget oneself and absorb all the literary tradition, mm -hmm. all the literary authorities, and then finding creativity out of that tradition. So we're finding it's, there's something similarity between Buddhist kind of compassion, you know, this absolute compassion, go beyond yourself and absorb everything in. So that, in there, we said maybe lies a type of agency, mm -hmm. um, and the agency of the translator. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a very different agency. But then, when Lama Diab was talking about that, he started talking about the, you know, the disappearance of our personhood in that act. And then I sort of piped up and say. To he, he, he said total disappearance, and I said total, you know, so maybe something remains. But I, I think that gets at the heart of what, you know, Ricoeur, who's very interested in phenomenology more generally, is trying to say, what is it like to occupy that space? And that's, and being hospitable, you know, not being shut down. So at the top of the second page where he talks about the pretensions to self-sufficiency, um, refusal to allow the foreign to, I think it means to mediate, um, ethnocentrism and so on. So not engaging in that and so being like open to another speaking to one. Yeah, and that's why, that's the way we're describing compassion in this particular context, the compassion of the translator. <laughs> okay, I'll start. So we we um we had a really interesting conversation. So a lot of different things. One of the things was that there this notion of linguistic hospitality in relation to the foreign could be thought of sort of as um, uh, when you're traveling, how a guest meets um, the host, and how uh, you know you might speak. You the the guest might try to speak the host language a little bit and the host really appreciates that and the host tries to speak the guest language a little bit and you do a ritual of meeting which is some kind of tea you have in some kind of culture and you try to have the tea in that way you know you try to have the chai and that there's a way in which um that that we could you know in dealing with the resistance we talked about different kinds of resistance relating to different kinds of texts where they may or may not be present um and the idea that um for Ricoeur, it's important to remember that he's in French and he's in a language which is very strictly limited by this kind of Academy Francais and the dictionary and that English is a more open language, which I talk about some of my work as a, a survivor's language, which, which was a mess in the beginning and absorbed all these other words, Anglo, Saxon, Viking, and still continues to absorb foreign words. Um, and so it is a good medium. It, you know, the word Dharma now exists in you know, the OED and you know, words like uh, dukkha that we talked about using with our classes to kind of get around a sort of simplistic understanding of uh, suffering as a term. So we thought that maybe um, the resistance to complete translation in English could be useful. Another image was like, uh, I had a, like a sand in a pearl that kind of stimulates then English to be expanded and be decolonized in certain ways beyond these kinds of um, sort of more Eurocentric models. So those were some of the things we thought about. Can we talk a little bit about appropriation? Could you go back to the beginning? I mean, I just wondered, I, 
I think leading off okay. what you said, you said? Okay. Um, so our task was to, again, yeah, deal with the uh, resistance to the foreign. And um, I guess one of the words, when we were talking about that, and especially in these, uh, I think unpacking what does that mean, um, I don't think in our circles, those who read our text, I was just drawing out this point, I don't think it's about, oh, I don't want to take that on. Actually, a lot of people are really curious to read what we're translating, right? And I felt that the risk in resistance to the foreign was uh, more, uh, what, what operates in our context maybe a bit more is the idea of appropriation, more so than fear of foreign. By appropriation, I mean this idea that people think when they read the translation that they've sort of got it, this kind of smug, um, they, you know, they, oh, now I understand Tibetan Buddhism, for example, and we need to be both, yeah, uh, th that's where the risk is in translation, is thinking that you can convey it all. And I f did feel like Rakur gave us a path out, and, and then, yeah, and that path, he gives us a path out of that. Yes, I think he does, right? And then that maybe I'll just end um, in thinking about our talking about resistance. We actually had a we disagreed, I think, a fair amount in a healthy way, and and then also agreed on um, maybe one of the takeaways would be um, thinking about when and how we maintain the the you know if we use the phonetics of the Tibetan word in English in order to kind of trouble uh, the reader a little bit and complicate them and let them know that although what we're translating they do have access to the term, but it may be a little bit more difficult. Um, than, than we, any of us wishes for it to be, and therefore to kind of ask the reader to do some more work um, by, you know, by expanding the possibilities of English. Um, and I think also just to, I do like, I mean, I like so many things that Ricard's doing here, but one of asking us to notice the ways that we might be um, worried about the resistance of the reader uh, just to, to raise that as a kind of consideration in our act of translation um, and are we doing things to alleviate the um, the reader of that difficulty or that that resistance in the reader that maybe we, we ought not to do right and to think about methods or modes of coming out of that um, possibility of resistance right did you want to add anything no okay okay So Nishita brought up um, Talal Asad uh, as a kind of counterpoint to this and thinking that perhaps Rukur uh, is occupying a relatively op optimistic stance on interpretation, or sorry, on, on translation. Um, and I think it's a, it is an optimism, but it's one that's rooted in a, a commitment to the idea of imperfection, of the imperfection of the translation, and right, and that we are going to betray both, right? We are going to both betray the, the the author and the reader in our act, and, and to sort of, in some sense, to as you are all saying, to kind of, you know, um, not not just embrace that, but to be active and um, and um, and th in thinking about how we ought to do that, right? Um, that we that we are in, in by necessity going to do both. But so uh, As Assad is occupying a somewhat more or definitively more pessimistic view on this, but um, but that was also something that we talked about a bit. Okay, so thanks. Um, so we just have a few minutes. Uh, one thing I brought up uh, at the beginning was to say that um, I think there might be a third option um, to to this, and so it's not just a dilemma as to whether it's incommensurability or whether you can translate. Um, uh, and so I don't think there's necessarily you know, two masters here. Um, a text that I've been assigned twice uh, was uh, The Monolingualism of the Other, Derrida's Monolingualism of the Other. It's the only book I've ever read of his. I, uh, it's good, but you know, it has some ideas that actually later I, I encountered in much more cogent, um, easy to express, uh, Articulations, but but what he says that, that's so interesting is that, um, and it's a refrain in the text. I only have one language, and it is not my own. So even that thing which you think is so intimate and inherent in you, it's not yours. So you don't even master your own language. It's too slippery. It's always changing. It's imposed on you from outside. Um, it goes along with all kinds of other restrictions on your being and freedom. Um, and so I think that that's a, an interesting way forward to. Um, blow up the dichotomy between, oh my gosh, uh, can I reach out or not? Uh, you know, the place you're standing in already is very tenuous. So uh, I would encourage other people to read it. I think it's well regarded. Yeah, the monolingualism of the other. So that's, that's one thing to think about. Christina, do you want to say something? Um, 
so then we went from there to um, thinking, if that's the case, we don't have to worry so much about betrayal because we're not really even kind of uh, uh, owning anything in the way we might have thought we would. And so um, then we planned a dinner party, which was super fun. Um, and so we thought about kind of, you know, the guest of honor as the text, which we have already kind of engaged in a relationship of making an invitation to. Um, and then all the other kinds of guests that we might have at that party. Um, and we had a wonderful example of uh, some very different translations of the Tao Te Ching. And so kind of a sense of, um, yeah, hospitality really making a situation for an encounter and a dialogue to happen. Um, and this came... Uh, and the guests come along? Oh, yes. The, the possibility of the plus one <laughs> was there. Yeah. And so, but some guests necessarily are swinging singles. So then you might have to find a date within um, your known crowd. So yeah, we had a lot of fun um, with that metaphor, thanks to... Um, was that? Yeah, and so, I mean, there, there could definitely be some guests that have too much to drink um, and become less coherent. Um, so what do you do with them? One last comment. It's, uh, there's a, a short story about translation that I think uh, Lama Jop would like, um, and it has to do with the violence. So sometimes the violence, uh, right, the translator can do some kind of symbolic uh, uh, violence to the text, but the translator can also be uh, hurt. So there's a great story about this by James Salter. Um, and, you know, he's a man's man, and he, you know, the the whole analogy is a little bit is sexist, but I'll just use it because it's, it's provocative. So there's a, a man, and he is married, not so happy with his wife. He has a girlfriend. He's having an affair with her. He wants to get out of the marriage, and uh, so he plans to get rid of his wife and then run off with his lover. So he goes through the process of getting rid of his wife, then ready to get in the car and run off with his lover and have you know, a wonderful uh, romantic, uh, love life for the rest of his life, and then he's abandoned right at that moment by um, the lover. So he returns home thinking, God, what am I going to do? And he walks in the house, and his wife has come back to life, and she's there. So the person he thought he could get rid of won't go away. The person he wanted to have leaves him, and he is, is stuck there. So there's you know, also another way to talk about this. You know, do you serve two masters? Maybe you know, in the end, you don't have a choice, and you're the one that's going to be um, you know, punished. Uh, punished in some way. Yeah, so there's that too. as a secret, but in, a, in my talk, um, the title of my talk is an act of translation, you know, an, well, an act of bardo, translating Tibetan poetry. In Tibetan, if you notice, it's called Puche Nyangr Jirui Bardu Le, okay? So Lhasa Le. So it's ambiguous, it's not a really good translation. I came up with the Tibetan title first before I wrote, the, uh, this, um, wrote my talk. So the English title is a translation of the Tibetan title, but it's not a good translation if you look at it. Yes, it's an act of bardo, but le, as you know, is also karma. Yeah? So here it also has this kind of view of fortune, karmic fortune. So it's our, us translators, it's our karma, our fate to be stuck in this bardo. Yeah, so I'm afraid we're like that, we're just stuck. That's one thing, that's as a noun, it's just, you know, of course, the act to do something, but to also the doing of something, but also just karma, just you're stuck. There's nothing we can do, we're just, doesn't matter how good you translate, we're always stuck. You know, that, that, that's the one, one thing. It's also karma, by the way. And um, 
I thought it would be interesting. I'm sure you have thought about the Tibetan term for translation. Uh, you know, Kejur, Lozawa is obviously Sanskrit. We know that Loza, Loza Chekandu, Loza, Loza Chekandu. But usually we say Jur, and obviously the different tenses, um, or Njur. The two things, you know, Njur, um, Shakespeare can Jur do. I don't know some translation of Shakespearean play. Once it becomes established, it's a, it becomes Anja, Anga, Tanjashim, Jur, and Jur, becomes non agentive. So I think it's very interesting. Jur means obviously to change or to turn, but it literally means to turn, the, to steer the horse back, the back of the direction. So when you, if, you have a, if you're in a chariot or if you're riding a horse, so you're going this way and suddenly you want to go back. So that's where the word comes from and also obviously transform and tr change. And then jur becomes just happens, it's almost spontane yeah, spontaneity achieved. So what happens is that we are both involved, we're really active. And once our translation is finished, it's like the death of the author. So that's finished, that's it. What Tibetan says, meaning when a word escaped, you cannot catch it. When a horse bolts, you can catch it. You can catch a horse that runs away, but you cannot catch a word that you uttered. Like that, the translation is finished. Once translation is finished, it's in the public. The public and the general readership turns into, transforms into something. Then it becomes njur, I think. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's quite yes, an interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, you can never get away from the fact that you, you can go back to the original thing. Oh, no, there was that that I didn't get. Oh, no. That's always going to be an albatross yeah. around your neck. And then, but yet your translation is no longer in your control. You can't, wait, I want to make a modification. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. Uh-uh. You, it's not yours anymore. It's time for a second edition. Yes. <laughs> but, I think we, we do worry about that very much. We, we really honor this work that, and then also be trained the reader. We need to keep both of them in mind. And, and we can't just sort of say, I don't care what you think, I'm going to translate this in whatever way I want to. So I just wanted to say that.